Our Sunday study of the book of Ezra continues today in chapter 4. And now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles built the temple unto the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. We sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezar Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. <coughs> In the short time we have this morning, I'd like to get you right into the story. When the city of Jerusalem collapsed, the Jews of Judah were carried away captive to Babylon. Seventy years later, the Babylonian Empire collapsed, and the Medes and the Persians took over. Cyrus, the Persian king, gave the Jews permission to return to their homeland and build again the temple of God in Jerusalem. Most of them were no longer interested by that time, but give credit to the few who made the homeward journey. They set God back in the center. Though their numbers were few and their resources limited, Though their settlements were largely unfinished and unguarded, they began to build the house of God on Mount Zion. And it was a memorable day for them when the foundations of that temple finally were laid. They made a good beginning, but that's all it was, a beginning. We all know how easy it is to start something. Schooling, a job, career, a marriage, a Christian life with high hopes and great expectations. But it's quite another thing to carry through on it till completion. Nothing you do for God will ever go unchallenged. You will be opposed every inch of the way. There is truth to the old proverb where the Lord builds a chapel, the devil builds a cathedral next door. The wolves never attack painted sheep, as Jesus reminded us. Marvel not if the world hate you, for you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now compromise your principles, lower your standards, go along to get along, no problem. But you hold to the Bible truths, you hew to the straight and narrow as the Lord has laid it out, and you are in for a very bumpy ride. So the first ominous chord is struck in these verses. And the overtones will carry through the rest of this book and on through the next one as well. But the conflict began in the guise of cooperation. The text tells us when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin saw that the refugees were building a temple to the Lord, they came to Zerubbabel, and to the family fathers and said, let us help you build the temple. For we seek God as you do. We have sacrificed unto him since the days of Ezar Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. The offer sounds good on the face of it. So friendly and neighborly and sincerely meant. You are few, we are many. Your resources are scant and we can help you pay for this project. There is strength in numbers after all. And it sounded like such a sweetheart deal and so reasonable that we are surprised at Zerubbabel's reaction. His answer was a flat refusal. 
N-O. He said, you have no part with us. We alone will build a temple to the Lord our God as Cyrus, king of Persia, commanded us. That answer sounds so harsh and abrasive and undiplomatic, we wonder what's going on. Well, the Samaritan neighbors didn't lie exactly. After all, every really good lie has a kernel of truth in it. Long before Jerusalem fell, the Assyrian armies overran the northern promise province, they captured the city of Samaria, and they deported the ten tribes of Israel. Now, to fill that vacuum in the land, they brought in other deported peoples to resettle the place. Folks from Babylon, Cuthan, Ava, Hamath, Zeraphim, but the whole thing was a disaster. And the only reason they could think of was we don't know what the God of Samaria requires of us. See, they had their gods of the mountains and the valleys, gods of the lakes and the rivers, gods of light and darkness, gods of sterility and fertility, but they didn't know what the God of Samaria required. So, the king of Assyria sent them a renegade priest of Israel to show them how to please the God of Samaria. And this cat sets up shop at Bethel with a golden calf. Now, here's a classic case of the blind leading the blind, and the ominous phrase appears, they feared the Lord and worshiped their own gods. Is that possible? But what kind of gods were they? Well, the Babylonian folks brought along Sukkoth Nebolith, a feminine deity. And the folks from Abba had Nergal, a lioness with wings. And the folks from Zepharvaim, they brought on Adramelech and Anamelech, the one, the body of a fish with a human head, and the other one, a snake with a guy's head and a crown, and, and into those ceremonial fires, they threw their own sons and daughters as human sacrifices. Oh, they feared the Lord, but they served other gods. Now that sounds primitive and barbaric to you, and it really shouldn't. I know all kinds of sophisticated Americans who wouldn't make a move any day until they consulted the bull, the goat, the crab, the fish, and the lion in their daily horoscopes. Only they use the Latin names so it doesn't sound so gross. Uh, sign of Taurus, Leo, Aries, Capricorn, Piskies. And since 1974, the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision 35 million American lambs of God have been carried away in buckets of hospital waste. Abortion, euthanasia, right to die, do-it-yourself suicide. People, where do you think we're heading? And that's the tip-off to Zerubbabel. He picked up on that. Yeah, yeah, you fear the Lord and serve your own gods. Hey, been there, done that. That's what got us into trouble in the first place. That's why we spent 70 years as slaves in Babylon. We had a religion where we feared the Lord in name, but we served our own gods, man. We had something for everybody. 
We didn't pull the grand temple of Solomon down. All we did was shove the old altar of sacrifice into a corner and install the altars of Baal and the phallic totems of Ashtoreth and the colorful signs of the zodiac. And to show how broad-minded we were, we invited the sodomites and the temple prostitutes and we brought in the psychics and the spiritists for those of you who want to contact the dead or believe in the reincarnation. And we learned something out of that. God ain't going to play second fiddle while we direct the orchestra. And we ain't going to do it again. We're not going to tempt the Lord one more time. The answer to you people is no. Wow. The, the, the word for mingling religions together is syncretism. The word syncretism means that you take opposing, contradictory religious beliefs and put them in the same melting pot. You know, something for everybody. And that goes on all the time. Survey after survey will tell you that you ask a religious question of the American public, hey, why don't you ask the key question, how are you saved? And you get a hodgepodge of good works and good intentions and prayers and penances and sincerity and psychology. When the Bible says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins and says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And every good thing you ever did is really a response to that redeeming love of God for you in Christ. As in, we love him because he first loved us. But it's an old game to boost the membership, beef up the revenues, pose an important figure in the community by writing new names on the old idols. That little republic of Haiti off our shore is a good example. The official religion of Haiti is Christianity. The unofficial religion is voodooism. And so it's not surprising to find on any altar a shrunken head, a disemboweled chicken, and a crucifix. And I'm not so sure this syncretism hasn't crept in among us Lutherans. Give them what they want. Not so long ago, we started a mission in a growing city south of us and built, at the beginning, a large elementary school and opened it to anyone who would pay the tuition fee. The classrooms of this school were filled at once by people who paid the price of admission. Well, these outsiders then sued the church to get representation on the board of control. And the next thing you know, <laughs> the Lutherans are on the outside of their own school looking in. And we lost the whole shebang. But why should that surprise you? Whoever told you the faith was something you buy and you sell. Or that you could reduce the religion of Jesus Christ to a mercenary business transaction. Ah, oh, people, keep it simple. Repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Repentance means that you renounce yourself as Lord of your own life and surrender your life 
to the will of your Lord. As Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You'll never be disappointed. You, you can take the, the religion of Tibet, which you're making movies about, the Dalai Lama, and, and Hinduism, and Buddhism, and the New Age movement, and Scientology, and they're all interchangeable. But not Christianity. I am the way, Jesus said. And there is no other way. I am the good shepherd. I am for you the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Now either Jesus is everything he claims or Christ is a fraud and a liar but you, nobody can have it both ways. That's why St. Paul says be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Beloyal? What part is he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? And you are the temple of God, as he hath said. Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And I will receive you, and be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters saith the Lord Almighty. Amen.